Hey folks, this is Scott Hanselman. You may know me from some of my other Windows related tutorials. You can check them out on my YouTube channel uh, under the Windows 10 playlist. And I also did a number of tutorials on Windows 8 and learning the new interface. Uh, today in this video, I wanted to share with you some of the cool new features that are coming in Windows 10, what they're calling Anniversary Edition. It's been a year since Windows 10 came out. Specifically, I want to talk about Bash on Windows, or the Bash shell, also known as Ubuntu on Windows. So it's the ability to run Linux stuff on Windows. But what does that really mean? What can you do? What can't you do? Well, here's how you set it up. You can see that I'm running the Insider Preview. Uh, the rumors are that this is going to come out uh, sometime in August, uh, but you can certainly get this if you're an insider now. You can sign up and go and you know look up or Google uh, Windows Insider, you can plug in, or you can wait a couple of months and you'll get this as well. Um, now I'm going to go and hit the Windows key, and I'm going to type Features, and it says Turn Windows Features On or Off. Brings me to this dialog right here, and uh, you don't have to turn on what they call Hyper-V. This is not a virtual machine. You scroll down to the bottom, and you click the Windows Subsystem for Linux, and you'll notice it's marked as Beta, and even though uh, the Windows Anniversary Edition will come out. Uh, I anticipate that it'll still be called Beta because it's uh, it's kind of one of the first times they've done something like this and they want to make sure they get it right. So then you hit OK and you'll see that it'll say Applying Changes and it's going to need to do a reboot. So I'm going to do a reboot. We'll pause time and I'll be right back. So I'm back. I've just rebooted after turning on that feature. So I'm going to hit the Windows button and I'm going to type Bash. You might see Bash on Ubuntu on Windows. When I click that, it's going to pop up this console here. This is like the DOS prompt, right? And it's going to say, this will install Ubuntu on Windows, distributed by Canonical. This is really important because what they're saying here is that the bits that we're about to get are coming not from Microsoft, but rather they were distributed by and made by Canonical. We are really installing Ubuntu on Windows. So I'm going to hit Yes. But what it does is it downloads these from the Windows Store. Now, if I bring the Task Manager over and look at the network, you can see that right there. You see Microsoft LXSS, so the Linux subsystem tool, is bringing this down. So we're installing Linux. And what this is, is not the kernel, but basically everything but the kernel. It's what they call user mode, because this is still Windows. We're not running a virtual machine. They're going to bring down the ELF, that's E-L-F, the ELF binaries, and the user mode bits. So not the kernel mode bits, but the user mode bits that make Ubuntu Ubuntu. Uh, this won't include the GUI stuff, so I'm not going to go and run, uh, you know, Firefox for Linux. This is about developers and command line tools. And then it says extracting file system. So let's go see if we can catch that happening. LXSS. Okay. And you can see it's this time and it's all it's extracting into here. So the Ubuntu file system root directory is sitting here, right? It's on my folder. So it's a Scott thing, which means that different users will get their own private Ubuntu, right? You got your bins and your whatnots and all that. Uh, and these are all kind of living in this universe. Now these files here are the Ubuntu files, right? I can't run this. I can't double click on that. And Windows isn't going to know what to do about that because it's just a, a file. It's just a thing. Uh, it is not a Windows binary. Okay, it's a Ubuntu or a Linux binary. See, I don't know, I don't know that file. Uh, enter your new Unix username. We don't want to run as root, so I'm going to run as Scott, and I'm going to give it a nice password. All right. Now, I'm going to go and close this because I want to show you the icon that you're going to get. So you see here we've got Bash on Ubuntu on Windows. This is the canonical or the Ubuntu uh, logo that we're looking at right here. So I'm going to double click on that. You see it appears up here. And I want to point out something. We've got what they call DOS, you know, the DOS box or what's actually called the command prompt. We've got PowerShell. And we've got Ubuntu. Now this is a little subtle, but you know, folks like to hear the details, right? See what's really going on. What's going on here is that there's a thing called 
con host, the console host. That's the thing that owns this box. It's the thing that puts the icon there. So if you click on PowerShell and go Properties, or you click on Ubuntu and go Properties, that's the same dialog box, you see? So some of those new features that you get when you get a console on Windows 10 uh, will give you things like transparency, right? You get in both environments. So if I want a transparent shell for Bash and Ubuntu, I will because ConHost is uh, the same on both of them. So the same console host gives us new features. That also allows us to do things like resizing, which is something we've all asked for for a long time. And one of my favorite features, which is pressing Alt Enter. So now you can see that my Ubuntu window has gone full screen, but I'm gonna keep it like this uh, so you can see that I'm still running Windows. All right, so let's see what the heck's going on here. So I'm gonna type LSB release. This is a Linux standard base release. It's a thing that says, what the heck's going on here? Tell me about this, this system. You can go to any Linux machine basically and type in Linux uh, standard base release dash A and it'll tell you, oh, well, this is Ubuntu. It's Ubuntu 14. They codenamed it Trusty. And what I usually do the first time I install Linux is I go and I say apt update. Okay. And it says, well, I can't do that. Unable to lock the file, right? It says, are you root? Now this can be a little confusing because we are running Windows, but we are also running Linux. So what's the deal with the versions and stuff here, right? Well, again, let's go back to the task manager see what's going on. You see Bash is running. You see how it has no icon? It's kind of weird because it doesn't really know what's going on here. If I right click and say open file location, task manager's like, I have no idea what kind of process this is. It's some kind of magic process. That's because they did magic to make it so that you could run Linux binaries on Windows. But I can go here under users and I can see that it's running as me, right? And it's definitely not running as administrator. Uh, additionally, though, the administrator on Windows and administrative permissions is different from super user or root on Linux. So I'm going to say sudo super user do apt update. And it's going to say what password. Type that correctly this time. And now notice it's going out to Ubuntu. It's going out to Ubuntu, not to Microsoft, to get these updates because it is Ubuntu. Uh, let's see if I need to do anything else. sudo apt upgrade. And it says, okay, well, here's some stuff that we might need to update uh, that is, you know, out of date. The apt update will go and, you know, get the, the latest list of stuff and apt upgrade goes and upgrades it. Now, while this is happening, you notice that you're getting color. You changed from green to brown. It's because they've added new features like ANSI. Uh, and also I can get kind of word wrap as well, which can sometimes confuse uh, things that don't expect the console to uh, change out from underneath it. So this is almost done. One of the other things I want to point out is that I went here to fonts and I went and got the Ubuntu Mono font. This is the actual font you see when you install Ubuntu, and you can do that as well. And in fact, in this version of Windows 10, all the mono spaced or the appropriate console fonts will automatically appear here. In the old days, you used to have to go into the registry and mess with a bunch of stuff in order to make that happen. And now, nice new update, you don't have to sweat that. So I'm gonna fast forward time just to make this a little bit quicker. This isn't something you have to do, but it, you know, if you're running an Ubuntu machine, you might want to keep it up to date. All right, so that's done. So I can type things like ls. You can see what's going on here. There's home slash Scott. Now, this is important to point out. This is not my users. If I go to C users Scott, this home Scott is not this home Scott. I'm in the Linux world here now. To be more specific, if I type something like df-h to say, tell me about your machine, you can see that it, it knows that it's on a big hard drive, you know, and, it, and this, is, this is all true here, but it's in a Linuxy 
world right now. The, the uh, file system will grow as much as it needs to, but where are the Windows files, right? Well, they're in a folder called Mount, and those are my C drives. There we go, see? So here's users Scott. Now here's where things get a little crazy. In this case, everything's marked as executable and writable and readable because the Windows file system permissions and the Linux file system permissions are different. But if I go back over to Linux world, now we have varying and reasonable permissions, right? So it's something to be aware of. So we can go get some of my favorite things, sudo apt install htop. All right. And now I can type htop and I get this task manager. But again, this is the Linux task manager that's showing really not just all of Linux in this case, because we don't have the Linux kernel. It's showing just the things that are running in my user space in this area right here. You can see bash, init, htop. And I can also do some resizing again, just to prove that they've thought about this. You get some pretty nice resizing. Okay. I can type top. That's there as well, which means that I can type probably VI. Okay. And then I get out of VI. Do we have Emacs? So I type in Emacs and it says, wait a second, I don't, I don't have Emacs. I don't know anything about that. So I'll go and say sudo apt get install uh, Emacs and we'll get Emacs uh, 2.4. Say yes. Again, going to Ubuntu to do that. Now I could add other apt directories. I could get stuff from other places. I'm not limited just to there because it's a real Linux machine. The kinds of things that you'll bump into, the, the things that don't work will be... Uh, you know, kernel mode things. If you want to talk to a USB device, you have to remember that there's no Linux kernel under here. There's a Windows kernel under here. All the Linux syscalls, the system calls into Linux, are being captured and then redirected to the Windows kernel. So Windows does the work and Linux asks for it. This allows you to run user mode stuff, not kernel mode stuff. It's also important to remember that this is not for what they call server workloads, right? This doesn't mean, oh, well, cool, I'll take all of the Windows machines at my work and they'll start running Apache and, and all these server workloads. This is meant for developers. Developers or fans of Linux or people who think that this is the year of the Linux desktop, except it runs on Windows and then you run bash at the command line. The other thing worth pointing out is that what about SIGWIN, right? Well, SIGWIN is a really popular Linux-like environment, okay? But look here, SIGWIN is not a way to run native Linux apps on Windows. It's a collection of Linux-like utilities that let you run functionality that is similar on Windows. So it gives you uh, uh, some functionality, but it is basically... Uh, GNU things, remember GNU is not Unix, uh, GNU things that have been recompiled to Windows. But this is really Ubuntu. So when we're downloading Emacs here, it's not the Windows version of, of Emacs, it's the real thing. And this means that you've got apt and SSH and rsync and grep and awk and sed and Python and Perl and Ruby and PHP and all those kinds of things. So that allows us as Windows people or as people who enjoy running Windows, to go and do, you know, examples, what we see online, hello world in Linux, for example, uh, and really do it. Like we could really go and run like GCC, for example. So when this is done, why don't we get GCC and we'll compile a Linux application and we'll do that by going to a Linux website. So this means that as a Windows user, I'm gonna be able to do Linux stuff. Because I always feel like when I visit a website and I see that prompt, that dollar sign prompt, that says, oh, that's not for me. I've, I've reached a part of the internet where I don't get to do stuff. Now, I know that I could go and run a virtual machine, but you know, virtual machines feel heavy. This is not heavy. I can go and make another prompt and go and do other stuff. And uh, it didn't take any effort at all. Close it up, keep going. I, this is not a virtual machine. This lets me run stuff quickly and easily. And it feels lightweight. Well, you know, even on a fast machine, it doesn't feel to me like things are, are lightweight. 
here's apt-get, here's bash. You can see all the Linux things happening at the same time. Uh, in the background here, as we go and install all the stuff that you need for Emacs, which is a non-trivial amount of stuff. Okay, I type Emacs, and I've got it. I've got actual Emacs, there it is. That means everything, I'm moving around, go to the tutorial, check it out. Can't remember how to exit, it's all good. All right, so here, I'm gonna go and use Windows hotkeys, Windows right, Windows left, and here I've got Ubuntu on the left, and I've got a uh, STL Linux, so, you know, a Linux website teaching me how to do Linuxy stuff. So I'm gonna go and do a hello world, but do I have a compiler? I don't. Well, do I need all that stuff? Now I need the build essentials and GCC and all that stuff. What do I need to do? Installing compilers. So here I am on the Ubuntu website. I'm gonna go get build essentials. We'll fast forward time. So now that that's available, I can go GCC-V. I get all the information about the version of GCC. I can type make-V. All right. So then let's go back over here and let's do our little hello world. Notice that I pasted by right clicking. I could also go and say edit paste. And of course, because it's Linux and because it's got all of the coloring and everything that's built into Conhost, it's just writing out to the terminal and it looks nice. I got syntax highlighting. Now I'm going to go and write and quit. I've got hello C there now. And let's go and say GCC, output it to a file called hello. Hello C, that was fast. There's hello. You notice that it's got a little star there. It's ready to be executed. And it's fast. Like, it, it wasn't, uh, it didn't chew on anything. There wasn't a hard drive freaking out. These are native things. This runs, you know, in my experience, 99% of the speed that it's supposed to run, which is really nice. And it also means when I go and find uh, tutorials that uh, are for things that maybe we, the Windows people, aren't supposed to play with. Like, for example, uh, I wanted to use a thing called TensorFlow. And it turns out that it runs literally everywhere but Windows. So I went and fired it up on an Insider's build. Installed it, got Python, got all the native APIs, and it worked just great. So you could go and do all sorts of cool stuff. I could get, uh, you know, Redis or Redis server. You get the idea. A lot of times you're going to get prompted to go and apt get things. So you'll find yourself doing that uh, quite a bit. I've gone and pinned that. I can also go and grab it from here. I've gone and pinned that. You can also put it in your taskbar. So then here, if I move it down, I've got DOSBox, I've got Bash, and I've got PowerShell, all available to me. And they work just great. And then, of course, if you're on Windows 10, as I said, you can say Alt-Enter, which is nice. You can also go like this, make a virtual desktop, throw it over there and have your own virtual desktop that is uh, for Ubuntu. So this is coming soon, but again, if you're an insider, you may have had this for a long time, but everybody gets it soon. You just have to go over to features and turn it on. Great stuff. Windows subsystem for Linux, also called Bash on Ubuntu on Windows. Thanks so much, and uh, please do subscribe.